Right. Okay. Well, thank you again, everybody, for coming tonight to the online journal club for the Journal of Hand Surgery European. So a, a reminder of uh, what's going to happen tonight, we will discuss two papers. Uh, first of all, uh, we will uh, have a critical appraisal of the papers uh, by a fellow, followed by expert panel discussion, and then the handling editor will share his views about the paper. Uh, and then through, throughout it all, the, the author will be invited to, to give uh, um, um, their comments. So, and then finally, we'll discuss some questions from the floor. Uh, a reminder to please put your questions in the Q&A function. Please participate. Please give us lots of questions uh, so we can uh, make this a more interesting discussion. So please allow me to introduce tonight's panel, uh, Natalie uh, Bini. Our first presenter is an orthopedic resident uh, uh, who is now in Italy, but uh, was a fellow from the Institut de la Manne, Paris. Julia Rustin, uh, our second presenter, is a hand fellow from uh, Manchester. Uh, for our expert panel tonight, uh, we are delighted to have with us Professor Greg Giddens, consultant hand surgeon from Bath, ex-editor-in-chief, General Hand Surgery European and past president of the BSSH. We are also delighted to have with us uh, Mireya Esplugas from the Kaplan Institute Barcelona in Spain. Our handling editor of the two papers uh, tonight is Jeff Hooper from Edinburgh, also ex-editor-in-chief uh, of this journal and past president of the BSSH. And finally, we have the authors of the two papers, uh, Ryan Trickett from Cardiff and uh, Isidro Jimenez from Gran Canaria in Spain. So we are so pleased to have all of you tonight. Uh, yes, Zaf just reminded me that we're also going to have uh, some polls tonight. We will conduct these polls at the end of each uh, uh, paper discussion. So, right, let's, let's get into it. Uh, we have two fantastic papers lined up tonight. Uh, you should have received them when you register, uh, both on very common conditions in hand surgery. So the first is on trigger fingers. Uh, what do you do when you want to inject a trigger finger? So let's come and find out. So over to you, Natalie. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Anta Bini, and uh, I'm a resident in orthopedic and pediatric and surgery in Italy, but I was uh, multiple times fellow at the Institute of Biomarket. And uh, tonight I will present the first paper uh, published in April 2020 by Alessandro Jimenez and, coll and colleagues. And um, they uh, write this article about a randomized control trial of dorsal web space versus palmar midline injection of steroid in the treatment of trigger digits. So a very common uh, pathology. So the author start by presenting the background of the study. Uh, trigger digits uh, can be cost effectively and safely treated by corticosteroid injection, as we all know, with a successful outcome ranging from 45 to 92%. The problem is the most common uh, uh, kind of injection, the palmar one, is uh, very painful. So the authors uh, um, ask if the dorsal web space injection would be less painful. So uh, they set a, a randomized controlled trial uh, lasting two years, and uh, their primary outcome was the vast for pain during the injection. Uh, so they enrolled 160 patients with only 22 loss of the follow-up. All the adults with a trigger digit were enrolled, and the exclusion criteria, as you can see there, are the multiple trigger fingers, previous surgery, uncontrolled diabetes and hypertension, pregnancy or breastfeeding, and the inflammatory or autoimmune arthritis. Uh, the follow-up was set on one, three, and 12 months. 
So the injection technique presented in this picture from the paper uh, was either dorsal or palmal. Of course, uh, the, 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 the physician doing the procedure could not be blind, either the patient, but the people that analyzed the data were blind. So for the dorsal injection technique, uh, the non-used non, uh, hand was uh, of the physician was keeping the hand of the patient uh, lightly flexed uh, with the MCP joint in the, the hand and with the other hand uh, will perform the injection. While for the palmar injection, it was used a wolf uh, common injection technique with the needle insert uh, around the sheet of the tendon on the palmar mid central uh, side. So the data collected was the gender, the age, the comorbidities, the duration of symptom, the green classification, the dust score, the VAS, the resolution of symptom, and the complication. Um, the authors used data from previous studies as a guide to evaluate the minimal clinical importance change in VAS score, and it was set at 1.2. The student tests were used for VAS comparison and the key square and Fisher exact test for the group comparison. So these are the results that are presented very clearly in the paper. There were uh, 138 patients with a similar loss of follow-up in the same in, the, in the, the both groups. Uh, there were no statistical differences in demographic and baseline study data, and they obtained a statistically significant difference in the mean vas pain with the dorsal injection. So as you can see, with the palmar web technique, they um, observe a 5.4 range of pain during the injection versus a 3.6 uh, with the dorsal web technique. And the rate of success was good and similar and consistent with literature. So this was a very well-designed prospective randomized control trial with a clear primary outcome and also very simple to evaluate the pain. And there were a, a good number of cases and uh, the, the, the result is consistent uh, and uh, effective with the literature. So um, my... Um, what, what came to my mind reading this article, of course, being a resident interested in hand surgery, I try to study a lot about this subject, but the trigger figure digits is a very common pathology and a lot of uh, other orthopedics will have to treat it. And uh, my question is, what about the learning curve? Because uh, as uh, the author published uh, before in another article, they perform an anatomical study. And what we can uh, see is that there is a risk of neurovascular injury uh, doing the injection dorsally. So uh, is this a kind of uh, procedure that we can recommend only to expert and surgeon or for everybody? Thank you for the attention. Thanks very much, Natalie. Excellent presentation. So uh, if you can stop sharing slide, please, we'll have a, a time of discussion. So my the first question uh, to Isidro from, from Natalie, uh, is there a learning curve to this technique? So um, there is a, a concern that if you inject from the dorsum, you may inject the uh, injure the digital nerve. So, uh, do you need experience to do this in order to avoid nerve injuries? Yeah, so in, in, in our opinion, this injection technique is not really new. As most hand surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, or, or plastic surgeons are familiar with the dorsal technique, but for performing a digital anesthetic block. So this injection technique is quite similar, but applied to the trigger fingers. Uh, regarding to the success, as it is a subcutaneous injection, we, we, not, we do not believe that there is a real learning curve to achieve uh, good results using this technique. Regarding the complications, in our anatomical study, uh, as Natalie has presented, we found two neurovascular injuries in 112 injections, one nerve and one, and one artery, both in the same hand. When we found that, we were quite surprised and, and we believe that in clinical practice, the feedback with the patient during the injection could help us to prevent these injuries, since the patients may feel tingling, numbness, or, or some discomfort when the needle is close to the neurovascular bundle. And we could use this to modify the needle path. Uh, so we believe that there is not a huge learning curve and it, it should be safe in the clinical practice over the anatomical study. Okay, thank you. Just a reminder, if you have a question, please put them in the Q&A function rather than the chat. Uh, otherwise, the questions can be easily uh, lost. 
so please please retype your question in the QA function. Now I'm going to move over to Gray now. Gray, uh, um, just your general comments about the paper, uh, what you think about the paper, and also tell us what you currently do for trigger fingers. What is your preferred technique, Gray? Well, I thought this was a very interesting paper, very nicely designed study asking a simple question. So I enjoyed it. I thought it was very good. Um, my technique, I mean, I may be old fashioned out of touch with this. I still like the idea that we should be injecting at the site of the pathology. So if I'm injecting a thumb CMC joint, I want it in the joint. If I'm injecting the flexor sheath, I want it in the flexor sheath, though I am aware that the studies don't suggest it makes any difference and it's probably more painful. I, I like to think it does better. So I inject through the palmer side into the flexor sheath and I think I can tell when I'm in the flexor sheath and I'm not always in the flexor sheath. Okay, right. Um, over to you, Mireya. What, what do you think about the paper? Any questions you'd like to ask the author? I really enjoyed the article. Is it, it was a, a simple, well conducted and uh, short, and I learned a lot. Why? Because I usually inject my trigger fingers through a palmar uh, from a palmar side. I also some guide my injection, and I go to into the sheet from uh, from proximal to distal, and um, I. You demonstrated me that I can do uh, in another way, and that's good. Thank you. Okay, do you have any specific comments about the paper? Me? You are asking me? Yeah, yeah. A, a, a specific comments. Yes, I had a, a doubt. What happened to the 22 patients that uh, did not come, uh, uh, that were lost in the follow-up? Yes, there were exactly 22 patients lost to follow up. We tried to contact all of them by phone and we were able to contact 14 patients of that 22. Mm -hmm. uh, of them, 12 were as asymptomatic and two had uh, a mild discomfort, but they did not want uh, further treatment. In, a, in any case, all of those patients uh, who did not come to the one year follow up were excluded from the success analysis. Great. And when do when did you uh, recommend a second injection because they did not improve at all or because they only improved a little bit at the first month visit all patients who were not uh, asymptomatic who had not no uh, no symptoms no signs uh, were offered a second injection at the first month Okay, uh, Isidro, in your paper, uh, your exclusion criteria were patients with poorly controlled diabetes. Yes. Is that right? I mean, this, this is, uh, I mean, it's quite a common group of patients that we see with, with triggering of digits and actually recurrent triggering of digits. Uh, so we would like to know what your views are uh, for those patients. Uh, would you do a palmar or dorsal in, uh, injections? And maybe Gray can comment on that as well. I mean, Gray, I'm sure that's, those are the kind of patients that you see quite commonly as well. Uh, uh, um, I mean, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, we do not believe that including those patients with a, a theoretically more severe disease would change the, the pain results since the steroid was injected in the same location using either the palmar or the dorsal tenic. Uh, I believe that the success rate could be lower overall, but I do not think that adding those patients led to a differences between both techniques. But of course, the success rates uh, success rate may be uh, lower than we had. Okay. Um, just just a comment about our questions and answers so we can discuss them, okay? Uh, right, there's lots of questions coming in. We'll discuss that at the end. I want to uh, uh, continue to ask some questions in the paper. Now, you mentioned resolutions, resolutions yeah. of the triggering. So uh, what does resolution mean? Does it mean a decrease in the, in the greens uh, grade or does it mean complete resolution? What do you accept as resolution? Yeah, we define resolution or success as complete resolution of symptoms and signs. Therefore, an improvement in greens classification but having symptoms was considered as failure of the technique. 
Okay, so you accept nothing but complete resolution. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Gray, any comments? I mean, if I mean, would you feel comfortable in patients with mouth in with poorly controlled diabetes, multiple triggering, injecting just subcutaneously, or is there is there which well, goes I, mean, I think that's probably a slightly different question to this paper. I mean, I think it was reasonable for them to exclude those to keep the two P two groups fairly clean. I mean, I think we, I mean, I inject them. I think lots of people do inject people with um, diabetes, multiple fingers. And I think that's probably different studies that looked at whether it should be in the sheath or subcutaneously. And I guess that's probably not answering here. I mean, I imagine Isidro probably injects all of those patients from the back now, having done that study and probably finds that reasonably works well, but I'll leave him to answer that. Think, yep. Is it true? Any any comments? I think that's what you do, isn't it? That's your preferred technique now. Yes. Now we're using almost all cases, uh, injecting almost all cases from the dorsal side. Okay, Mireya, you wanted to yes, make a there, comment. There are some questions in the in the audience. They ask if there is only one surgeon who injects, and if there's a stratification of the if there are more than one surgeon, if there's a, a, a stratification of their level practice. Uh, we did that, that certifications and we are three surgeons who, who performed the, the injections. One of them was a, a level five, a, a great expertise on the technique, and the other two were level three. We, we performed the anatomical study and we have some clinical experience before doing the, the study. Okay. Thank you. Right, I'm just going to, before I answer more questions from the, from the floor, uh, I want to go over to Jeff now. So Jeff, how did you find uh, the review of this paper from Isidro, just yeah, in general? Well, the, the two reviewers, uh, we usually have two reviewers per paper, and they were very favorable about this one, um, pointing out that it was a common condition, that there was a message here that uh, a lot of people um, would uh, get some benefit from reading. Uh, so that from the point of view of reviewing, it was favorable. From the point of view of editing, it was a reasonably well-presented paper. Uh, there were just a few corrections that I requested, and they're quite common in papers that are submitted. And I'll just check from my notes here. Um, so a lot of the percentages, more than 10%, were given to decimal places, which we round them up to uh, a nice round number. And a lot of the mean measurements were given with uh, to two decimal places, which is inappropriate if the uh, technique used to make the measurement uh, is not does not have that precision. So I requested that uh, VAS scores, which is a continuous score, uh, can be scored either zero to ten or zero to hundred. I just said since they used zero to ten round it up to one decimal place, which is the equivalent of having a, a zero to a hundred and everything else such as the dash scores around to whole numbers. Uh, they'd use the word average, which is not very precise in a scientific paper. Uh, it should be stated whether the average means mean, median, or mode, because that's quite important when analyzing the data. Um, and the tables hadn't been submitted in the format requested in the submission guidelines. Now that is more or less universal when a paper is submitted, but it's up to the authors to follow the submission guidelines and present the tables in the correct fashion. And that was about it, man. They did that perfectly with their first revision. So I had no hesitation whatsoever in uh, accepting this uh, very interesting, nice, clear study that would be of benefit to a lot of our readers. I spend a lot of my time editing highly technical papers, which are of limited interest to a smaller audience. But this is one that I think most hand surgeons would enjoy reading. Thanks very much, Jeff. I mean, you know, authors often think that to publish a paper, they need to find some groundbreaking topics or, 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 or find a new technique. So what can we learn from this paper? It's such a simple topic, I mean, well, this, but very welcome, isn't it? Yeah, this underlines the fact that um, you can get a good paper out of everyday practice if you know, uh, if you find the right question to ask. 
um, as, as these authors did. So uh, I'd advise everybody just to be on the lookout for a new question about perhaps an old or everyday topic. Uh, that would be a publication that would be of great interest. I wish we had more um, submissions about these common uh, conditions. That was actually going to be my next question. How would you encourage authors to come up with new research questions? Well, just look at common topics. Uh, so that's very, very helpful. Now, uh, I'm just going to go to some of the questions. Some of these questions are actually uh, in the paper. For example, how many meals do you inject uh, dorsally and palmally? I think that's mentioned in the paper. Is that right, uh, Isidro? I think you mentioned one meal and... Yeah, so there are two millimeters, one milliliter of, met of metametasone and one milliliter of me mepivacaine, either from the dorsal or from the palmar side. Okay, uh, did you mention about the size of the needle? I'm just trying to see. 25, coach. Okay, I think there was one comment uh, from uh, Tim Hems about how he would uh, usually inject uh, the, from the palmar view, palmar side with a, with a smaller needle, with local anesthetic, and then inject the steroid. Uh, so, um, right, and I, th I think you inject all ones uh, in, in one injection, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. All in the same. Okay. So, uh, Zaf asked. Uh, he has some concern about fat atrophy if you just inject into the subcutaneous tissue and you don't go deep enough into the flexor sheath. Have you had any um, experience with that, or any of the other experts? Uh, is it true? Any fat atrophy? No, no, in, in this study. No, uh, okay. We've yes. recently reviewed our injections over the COVID period, and I think fat atrophy on the palmar side is rare. The skin is much thicker, and so you rarely see it. And I think that therefore helps this. I would just add a couple of points to what Jeff was saying, which is number one about. Uh, all the time when you're treating these common conditions, you should be thinking what I what could you do, but particularly challenging, you know, conceived wisdom of the past. So things like not using adrenaline in the digits, which has now been shown, and there will be other myths that will get broken in time. But also for me, it's very interesting. This paper not only answers an interesting question, but it then brings to mind the fact that you can just inject these subcutaneously, should you really be going through the sheath. So papers can do more than just one question. They can raise others for authors who are out there thinking, well, actually, maybe I should be rethinking what I'm doing. I think that there's a special interest here because when you inject uh, into the sheet and to the palmar site, into the thumb, you must uh, uh, locate your, the, hand, the patient's hand in a strange um, uh, fashion. And if you can do, go dorsal, this is a, 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 an easier way to inject the thumb. And I think that this is interesting. Okay, so a couple of other questions, but I think most of these answers are actually found, uh, can be found in the paper. Were all patients released by single injections? No, I, I think some of them require a second injection and, uh, and these patients were included in your analysis. Uh, uh, there's, a pa there's somebody who asked about whether any of the patients have pigmented skin. Were there any uh, complications with skin discoloration following injections? Is it true? No, 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 for no. that and, and no decoloration, no pigmentation. Okay. And we discussed this before. If you have a decoivance tenosynovitis, uh, where you also have to sometimes inject, would you inject subcutaneously or into the sheath? Because the skin there is maybe thinner. Yes, we usually inject subcutaneously too. But it is true that there we have some... Uh, cases of depigmentation of fat atrophy, probably be because the, the dorsal skin is thinner, as you said. Okay. Uh, right. I'm going to now ask the experts. Having uh, read this paper, having gone through this journal club, does, has this paper changed your practice? I will go to Gray first. Well, I, I'm going to be a bit ashamed to say no, it hasn't changed it. But it's really made me think hard again about these injections. And I really want to understand why 
if we're injecting at the site of the action in the flexor sheath, it's not better than subcutaneously. So I'm going to rethink and relook at that. So it's made me think hard and question my practice, even if not change it. Okay. Right. Mireya, what about you? For me, it's only what I, I have uh, told us before, uh, told you before with the thumb. Uh, I, I like to ultrasound guide uh, my, my trigger fingers. I like to see the, 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 the trigger. And I like that the patient sees the trigger with me in consultation. So uh, I will continue to inject under ultrasound guide through a palmar uh, uh, way, but I, I realize that the thumb is uncomfortable. So perhaps in the thumb, in some cases, I will go through a dorsal way. Okay, and so the interesting thing, and easy Joe, you can comment as well, how in your results, the thumb and the index finger, actually you get, uh, you get less pain, isn't it? Is it? Or, or uh, a lower, uh, uh, higher resolution when you inject uh, palmarly as compared to dorsally for the thumb and index finger. Yes, that's a really good point, but these differences were not statistically significant. And of course, okay. the sample size was small to, to this subgroup analysis. So it would be interesting to repeat this study, including maybe other units and a larger sample size to evaluate if there are differences between digits and techniques. Yes. Okay, right. I think uh, I think we'll conclude this part. I'm gonna I'm gonna share the poll, but I hope there has been a very uh, interesting discussion for everyone. And maybe this has changed your practice, and maybe more of you will consider a dose uh, uh, injection because uh, this study has shown that it is less painful and maybe uh, equally as effective. So this is the uh, first poll, and uh, I would like uh, uh, everyone to contribute. To this, so I will share the results at the end. So we will see at the end, easy draw whether people have uh, changed their practice because of your paper. Still waiting for a few, please. We that also raises the interesting question: How many good mm -hmm. papers do you need to change practice? I think it's quite a few. Yeah. So, uh, do you have any comments on that, Gray, or maybe Jeff as well? How many good papers? How many papers do you need to change practice? It would be a very interesting survey question. Well, I mean, I am staggered how certain things that seem to have been established and then still you have people doing other things so i think it can take an awfully long time jeff has been around even longer than i have so he'll have even more knowledge on this yeah i've been around a very long time gray um yeah i think sometimes it does take a few papers to change practice and so on but sometimes you just get one paper that you know is going to be sufficient and I, I think this is a good paper with a nice clear answer. And uh, I'm surprised at how s stuck in the ways that some people are. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. There's a clear okay. message. Right. I'm going to uh, share the results. Can everybody see the results? So this is so interesting, isn't it? So 67% uh, would still prefer a palma approach into the flexor sheet. And uh, well, uh, not many people have decided to take up the, the uh, uh, dorsal approach yet. Uh, so, and uh, interestingly, 8%, I don't inject trigger fingers. So this is extremely interesting, uh, but I hope food for thought. Great, okay. So we are gonna go into another very interesting uh, topic again, the management of bony mallet uh, uh, finger injury. Again, may maybe we can look at another example of uh, whether a paper changes practice or not. So I'm gonna pass the time over to Julia. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Julia Rustin and I am the uh, Training uh, Interface Group Fellow at Manchester currently. 
Tonight, I'm going to present a paper by Ryan Trickett, James Brock, and David Shuring, uh, named the Non-Operative Management of Bony Mallet Injuries. This paper was uh, published earlier this year in the Journal of Hand Surgery after one revision. So as an overview of the paper, the authors introduce the topic by outlining that there is a lack of consensus of the management of bony mallet injuries. Uh, they question whether splinting alone may be suitable for management of these, and they propose that uh, this is a suitable treatment, and they measure the outcomes of a cohort of patients, namely range of motion, extensor lag, and patient-related outcome measures, vascular pain, and the patient evaluation measure. This was a level three observational cohort study. So bony mallet injuries are a common problem for hand surgeons with an incidence of 9.9 .9 per 100,000 across the UK. Uh, approximately one third of mallet injuries involve a fracture, usually in the dorsal articular cortex, and this is what we term a bony mallet. Now, Tenderness mallets, an injury involving the extensor zone one, uh, are well recognized to get good results with splinting alone. This is usually done for a period of around six to eight weeks. However, the management of a bony mallet injury is contentious, and there is a debate between splinting versus surgery, and what are the indications for surgery. Uh, some people would regard that joint subluxation or a large articular fragment would be an indication for surgery. However, surgery is known to also have higher rates of complications, which may be more serious, such as K-wire infections or even osteomyelitis. So the authors therefore aim to evaluate their preferred technique, which is splinting of bony mallet injuries. Uh, this was a single center cohort study based at the University Hospital in Cardiff. Uh, it was a prospective data collection with retrospective analysis over a four year period. The patients included were all bony mallet injuries. However, the exclusion criteria involved any pediatric physial injuries or any injuries that went on to subsequently be managed surgically. All patients with a bony mallet injury were seen in A&E and given an off the shelf stack splint as shown on the left. They were then seen in the hand trauma clinic where they were reviewed by a consultant and had an individualized treatment plan made for them. Uh, this involved a splint, which in most cases crossed the DIP joint, as you can see in this central picture, but in five cases was extended to uh, cover the PIP joint as five patients had early signs of swan neck. The patients were taught how to perform splint hygiene and manage this although there are no further details in the paper about the splinting duration or the application technique. The study period ranged from April 2013 to April 2017, and the patient demographics, mechanism of injury, and hand therapy outcome measures were taken as follows, namely the active range of movement at both the PIP joint and the DIP joint, the presence of any extensor lag, and the visual analog scale for pain, as well as patient evaluation measure at the end of treatment. Patients were discharged by the hand therapist when it was felt that there was no pain and the patient had regained in functional motion. All those patients who uh, did not attend and complete hand therapy follow-up were taken out of the final analysis. Further data was collected from the radiographs according to the Weber and Schneider classification and the presence or absence of DIP joint degeneration. So this classification categorizes injuries as to class one the with no subluxation, class two with the presence of subluxation of the joint and class three, which were pediatric physial injuries. So excluded from this group of patients. These are subcategorized as A, B and C depending on the extent of articular involvement. In terms of statistical analysis, a kolmogorov smirnov found, test found that the, the uh, data was not in a normal distribution. Therefore, the non-parametric Cusco wallace and man whitney u tests were used for group comparisons. There were 211 patients with 218 bony mallets that were treated with splinting. There were nine patients who underwent surgery for bony mallets. Uh, these patients had either open injuries bilateral hand injuries, which otherwise required surgery, or had chosen surgery after their consultation with the consultant. And it was not always mentioned uh, what this decision uh, pertained to. 
there was a, a two thirds or nearly two thirds of the patients were male and there was a preponderance towards the ulnar digits with nearly seven, over 70% being on the ring and little finger. There was a median of three days between injury and review in the hand trauma clinic and the vast majority of these patients had in, re, initiated their injury from an impact to the fingertip. 208 patients completed their treatment plan, and this included five patients who did revert to the off-the-shelf stack splint. In terms of the radiographic characteristics of the patient cohort, most of these were class 1A or 1B, therefore no joint subluxation and a fragment of less than two-thirds of the articular surface. Most patients did not have any pre-existing joint degeneration. The authors present a very comprehensive table of data, and I will not go through all of this in this uh, presentation, but I've highlighted here the significant findings. Namely, that the key points are that across all of the Weber and Schneider types, there were no significant differences in the outcome measures. Again, across the congruent and incongruent joints, there were no significant differences. There was a notable difference, as perhaps to be expected, between the age of the patients with DIP joint degeneration. They were older, 69 versus a mean of 34 years old. There were extensor lag in 41 of the 218 fractures, and this was more common in patients with congruent joints. However, in those with subluxed or incongruent joints, the extensor lag was uh, a larger amount, 19 degrees versus nine, but this was not significant. The presence of joint degeneration uh, did not have a significant difference in outcome measures. However, there was notable extensor lag and poor active extension in these patients. Overall, there was a 13% complication rate. None of these were serious and uh, many were managed with modification of the splint. And in conclusion, the authors found that non-operative management of bony mallet appears to be a safe and reliable technique. They provided a, a discussion of the relevant literature and emphasized that numerous studies over the years have failed to demonstrate the superiority of one treatment over another. It is widely known that neglected bony mallet injuries can result in poor outcomes, such as swan neck deformity. Uh, this patient cohort had a similar complication rate to other comparable groups in the literature. However, they had fewer complications than those managed surgically in the literature. So this is a comprehensive analysis of the available data. The data was collected prospectively, but the authors do acknowledge that one critique of the paper is there was uh, no comparison or control group. And all, as the retrospective analysis meant that they were unable to control the data that was collected. Uh, limiting somewhat the analysis. They also mentioned that the accuracy of goniometer measurements may be questionable, uh, given that the DIP joint may have undergone some uh, deformity following these injuries. Patient-related outcome measures are uh, an important factor in such papers. However, in this case, they failed to demonstrate any difference across the groups, and it, there is a suggestion that they may not be sensitive enough for such an injury. Uh, there was also a slight lack of technical information in the paper, and this leads me on to my question to Ryan, which would be, could he explain a little more about the splinting protocol, such as how the splints were placed, whether they were placed with any manipulation of the digit, and uh, how long the splinting was conducted for? Thank you. Thanks very much, Julia. So... Excellent presentation. So over to you, Ryan. Uh, we really wanted to have more information about how you how you treated them. Uh, can you can you enlighten us? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Julia. So uh, we're very lucky in Cardiff. We've got a very experienced hand therapy team that work with us. So um, they drive much of the treatment for these injuries. Um, what they do is they custom make the thermoplastic splint, essentially using two squares. One goes under the pulp and one goes over the dorsum and it mirrors the design of the stack splint, but it fits slightly more comfortably. Um, we splint them for six weeks as a routine. Um, and occasionally patients, if they have still got pain, will then splint at their own preference for a few more weeks at night. But our standard advice is they, they discontinue splinting at six weeks. 
they all have the same advice about full-time splinting and get given the generic advice about how to take the splint off safely without causing uh, a droop in the fingertip so they can clean it as necessary and clean the fingertip. Okay, so I mean, I will go straight to one of the questions asked because it is related. Do you confirm reduction of the sublux joints in those that were sublux? Or do you just ignore the subluxation and treat all of this in an identical manner? Or, so or the therapies in, will, or the therapies will just, just put them in a splint and not, 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 not think? So the uh, therapists are uh, in clinic with us, um, and that's sure. one of the good points. Uh, so we, we, they sort of act to splint the injuries, and then we'll see them afterwards. The sublux one, subluxated injuries do go for an X-ray. Um, and then we'll look at the subluxation. I think one of the key things that Julia highlighted in one of her slides there, going back to Stack's original paper, is the difference between the hyperflexion and the hyperextension injuries. Um, and often some of these are probably, or in fact, probably more likely, most of these injuries are hyperextension injuries. Um, and therefore, what we often do with some of the subluxed injuries is ask the, ask the therapist to apply a slightly flex splint which seems to control the subluxation a little better. And we'll see that on the plain films. Is a persistent subluxation enough to warrant a surgical decision in the majority of patients? No. Um, and we, as Julia pointed out, we treated nine patients surgically during this period. So absolutely, um, the majority of these get treated uh, non-operatively. Uh, but so, we do so do you, a check you, film afterwards, mainly to make sure that okay. we've not made the subluxation into a frank dislocation. Um, okay. So, so yes, because that, was, that wasn't very clear uh, in the paper. So that's very helpful. So uh, over to you, Gray. Just general comments about the paper. Were you surprised by the, by the, by the outcomes that there's no difference? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Well, um, th this paper confirms all my prejudices. So, I, of course, I think it's absolutely marvellous. Um, but no, I thought it was very interesting, large numbers, um, and it shows that mostly we don't need to operate. Could I ask, Ryan, about those six patients who were chosen for surgery? What was the indication there? So we had nine that we treated operatively. A couple were open. One had fallen into a... a, a ground full of broken glass um, and the other was actually an angle grinder injury so not really true bony mallet fractures um, the others there were a couple of um, high level uh, I'm going to say hobbyists so one was a, a cellist and one was a, a high level sports person who opted for surgical treatment uh, and the others you know we're quite pragmatic about this about this paper and, and about the discussion uh, and we talk about the risks and the benefits and try and come to an agreement with the patient. Um, the majority of the others had more significant subluxation. And I think this is one of the criticisms of the Weber Schneider classification is the grade twos subluxation is uh, covers a multitude of sins um, from very subtle subluxation that you have to look carefully for on a lateral film all the way through to some of the ones that your, your papers show, Gray, where you have overt instability of that joint and, and dislocation, basically bolar dislocation. Um, and I think they're two different clinical entities. Okay, thanks. Uh, over to Miria. So what are your general comments about this paper? Uh, does it differ from what you do in your practice? Hi, Ryan. I enjoyed the article. It was, it was simple, but good. But I have a, um, a question. In around the Europe, around Europe, at least in Spain, we do not have hand therapies with us in clinics. And uh, do you think that this uh, would modify what you are telling us in your article? And how would you manage this without the hand therapies, which splints and uh, and follows the patient? Uh <sighs> I think you probably could, certainly for the bony mallet literature, the, the evidence isn't out there, but for tenderness mallets, the splint design has never really been shown to be superior from one technique to the other. Stack splint off the shelf versus thermoplastic versus Zimmer splint. And they all seem to have fairly equivocal outcomes for tenderness injuries. And, and I'm, I can't see a reason why that would differ for bony injuries. I think 
we are very lucky because we have a very experienced hand therapy department working with us and they do supervise much of the treatment. I'm not convinced that that supervision is any more labor intensive than removal of sutures or keeping an eye on the pin sites. Um, so I would, I think it would be feasible to do this without a hand therapy department, as long as you had access to, you, you know, the e easy one for, for, for most surgeons hands would be a Zimmer splint and an aluminium foam splint, which can be easily applied. The thermoplastic ones are, are sort of technically demanding. Okay, thank you. And well, my last question, do you think that, uh, do you know if patients uh, were worried about the cosmetic aspect of their fingers when this, uh, the DIP was a little bit subluxed or more subluxed? Not that we found. So we, we looked back through all of um, the clinical records for all of the patients to see whether anyone had represented for any reason, except in the fact that this is retrospective. We didn't recontact them all and probably some have been lost to follow up. We didn't have anyone coming back with any problems directly related to the mallet finger. The incidental finding of the non-union was, was a patient with rheumatoid who'd attended and had some generic x-rays of their hand for other reasons. So we did pick up some things, but no one coming back for cosmetic problems, no. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I think this leads on to one question that has been asked. It's all about the follow-up, uh, Ryan. Uh, so you mentioned uh, it's a retrospective study. Uh, you, 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 you saw some of them. Uh, none of them came back in the long term complaining of any problems. The question really asked, I, I think the question, uh, I'll, I'll read to you the question. Uh, if you look at, I think what the author meant is that if you look at the DIP joint on the X-ray carefully, uh, would you see the development of degenerative changes uh, uh, long term? I think it comes back to that, that question again. If you have subluxation in Second the long period. term, does it matter? Does it matter radiologically versus does it matter functionally and pain wise? I think it, it is the key to that question. We know that the vast majority of ladies in the middle to late ages will have some degenerate change at the DIP joints, and many of those remain completely asymptomatic. So the question boils down to, is it worth taking the risk with some of the surgical interventions? And, and there is a varying risk profile with those to avoid degenerate change in the longer term that is probably more likely than not to be asymptomatic. Um, I agree, if you looked hard at a lot of x-rays of mallet fingers further down the line, you'll probably see some degenerate change. Julia had a picture of one that had remodeled, um, which if you're critical, it has some osteophyte around the palmar site. Um, whether that patient presents with that or not is another question. Um, yeah, uh, we, ha we haven't looked at these patients long term with x-rays because this was based on our routine data. Okay, Gray, please. Um, yeah, I think that's very interesting. I think there are two key factors which would support Ryan's practice. One is we're dealing here with the concave rather than the convex side of the joint. And I think the concave side is much more tolerant. And unlike the lower limb, most of us aren't walking on our hands. And I think that that's just a big, big factor so that they, they don't wear in the same way. And then finally, to anecdote, we just don't see patients who had badly treated mallet injuries 20, 30, 40 years ago who come requiring treatment for these injuries. So I think it's largely a myth that I hope that Ryan's paper is going to help to debunk. Thank you. There is a question here, uh, Ryan, the continuer, uh, uh, um, continuing along the lines of the, uh, how the therapist uh, saw your patients. How often do, did they review the patients? So they would see them on the same day that we saw them and, and make the diagnosis. They would fabricate the splint um, and they would then, um, in obviously pre-COVID times, see them face to face. Uh, usually a week or two later to make sure they're managing the splint, keeping an eye on things. Um, our current practice is that is almost universally done remotely. Um, 
if patients have got problems and, and certainly some of the elderly patients might struggle with splint hygiene on their own, they'll see them a bit more. Um, but for a young active individual who is capable of managing their own splint, they'll then just see them at the six week mark, um, remove the splint, and that's when they'll start the active movement. We, we don't stick to a regime specifically on, on as and when to see people. It's pragmatic and based on what the patient needs. Okay. I mean, is there, is there any concern that, again, I might, I, I'll come back to Gray and Mireille as well. Is there any concern that some of these sublux joint actually will go into frank dislocation? I guess, is, is this sort of the only concern that we have? And, 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 and I mean, do we need to worry about that? Well, if I may say first, I mean, I think some of them do, and I think some of them do move. So we will often take a lateral hyperextension X-ray to look for some instability. And if they pivot, we think they're more unstable. And then we will watch them for two or three weeks. Uh, I think Ryan's absolutely right that if you're worried about the subluxation, if you put them into a, a splint in a little bit of flexion, then that mostly stabilizes and prevents that. So occasionally we'll feel they're subluxing a lot or they just seem to be drifting off over a few weeks and then we will wire them. Whether that really makes a big difference, I don't know. So that's our experience. So great. Uh, you do see these patients back after two or three weeks uh, in selected cases sometimes? Well, yeah, if we're worried about the subluxation, then we'll watch them with x-rays for a couple, at least two weeks after first presentation. So at week one, two and three. And if they're staying stable, we just splint them and then get them going thereafter. And just every so often, I don't know, two or three times a year, so a bit more than in Ryan's practice, we will see them subluxing and feel they're going, to, they're going a lot off and they may need surgery, but that may be an over-treatment. What is your preferred surgical treatment, Gray? Uh, well, I, I, I would just put a single wire across. I think it's very easy if you put a longitudinal wire to put it across the fracture site and then you just displace it. So I'll often put it obliquely, uh, but whether that really makes any difference, I, I don't know. Okay. Mireille, you want, you want to ask something? I saw you. I, I am concerned about the subluxation in lax patients and in young women lax, um, because I am worried about the, the PIP. Uh, and in those cases, I will follow the case uh, um, in a sh uh, strongly and uh, i think that i would uh, i would treat it surgically okay and what is your preferred surgical technique uh, i usually use key wires and i try always to 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 to, to keep the fragment sometimes i can and uh, most of them i cannot and i once used a uh, uh, plate hook I, I had to remove it because the the nail became uh, blue because of the, of the plate. Okay, right. I'm going to go to Jeff and then after that, we'll come back and conclude what, uh, you know, what final lessons we can learn from this paper. So Jeff, again, uh, how did you find the review process for Ryan's paper, reviewers' comments and uh, yeah. uh, uh, just general impression? Well, once again, we had two reviewers for this uh, paper and I won't read out the whole review, but the key bit for me was that uh, uh, well the first reviewer concluded that this paper has asked a relatively simple question answered with a clear conclusion and message uh, that the bony mallet finger injuries can be managed non-operatively even if there's joint subluxation so it was nice and clear once again uh, the second reviewer said this is a very interesting but this is a summary very interesting paper on a common condition provides a clear message for clinicians. So, you know, once again, we've got a common problem uh, of interest to a lot of people with, uh, you know, quite a, a reasonable approach and answer to the particular problem. From my point of view, the various technical things that the paper gets sent back to the author to sort out, we might hear and see a little bit of a theme here that, um, tables haven't been submitted in the journal format. Uh, most authors, even these experienced ones here, seem to think that 
in the editorial process, a miraculous thing happens that a paper that's been submitted with a load of boxes and things suddenly transforms itself into the format. It doesn't. The author has to do that and they get given clear instructions. Uh, also, there have been some repetition of results in text and tables. And this is once again a very common thing in the first submission of a paper. You know, you only need to give the results once in the text or a table or a figure, whichever is most clear. So that's something, again, a point for others submitting papers. Um, something else, yes, um, statistical methods. They weren't clearly stated in the uh, original submission. And I've written here my note to the author, you should state clearly that the data were not normally distributed and that's why you used tests applicable to non-parametric data. At the moment, the readers would have to infer this. So it's always a good idea in the methods section of the paper to have a little subheading statistical analysis where the tests, the pattern of the data is, is uh, stated and the tests used for the relevant data sets are also clearly stated. And if you uh, look at a lot of papers that are published, uh, they do have that section. But when that information is given in a haphazard way elsewhere in the paper, then it's not such a, a good thing for the reader. So those were the technical points that I raised with the authors. And once again, they were dealt with very efficiently on the first revision, and therefore I had no hesitation in accepting this. So at this point, I'd like to thank Isidro and Ryan and their co-authors for making my job really easy. <laughs> it's, it's not most of the time, but we do appreciate getting clear papers that are well presented as these both were. Thank you. And also Jeff, again, uh, like the previous paper, common topic, yeah, common absolutely. condition. Yeah, yeah. As I said before, if we had more of these, then uh, that would be of great interest to uh, hand surgeons who are dealing with common problems on an everyday basis. So if anybody out there has got something about a common topic, please write it up and send it in. We'd be delighted I'm, to give you advice about it. I'm going to put you on the spot a bit, Jeff, and also maybe to Graham Mireille as well. Uh, what other studies do you think we need for bony mallet? finger injuries or has this paper answered all the questions there is to answer <clears throat> it is the definitive paper gold standard paper uh, what other papers what other research should we be looking at in this topic There's, orion can answer as well a, a lot of papers end further research is needed further research is always needed so you, you know that's a redundant sentence effectively and the, a good paper will sort of lead on to further studies. And I think we've already drawn out one further topic, which is to have a look long-term and people who've been treated for um, mal bony mallet finger injuries with or without subluxation to see what the radiological outcome is and also what the symptomatic outcome is. So there's, there's a study that's um, possibly waiting to be done. Thank you. Gray? What, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I think it's a really good paper. I think it um, suggests, as you'll be pleased to know, I think that we should be treating more things non-operatively. I mean, it's very interesting that Weber and Scheider's paper, post published in 1984, has been quoted many times. I don't know what their citation for that is, but it's certainly probably into the hundreds. Um, and is it frankly wrong? I mean, you know, they said you should fix fractures where there's a, a fracture fragment of more than a third. Well, that, that just is not true. The paper of Kim and Kim um, from, I think, Korea showed that 48% um, was a sort of cutoff in terms of some subluxation risks. And as Ryan has showed, even that doesn't matter. Going forwards, well, we're now trying to reduce the splintage time. I think that these fractures, they're metaphyseal fractures in the hand. I think they'll be solid by four weeks, and we're looking at that. Um, I think Jeff's right. We want to be certain about the arthritic change so that, you know, that people can be more confident in that. Uh, I mean, I also wonder about the swan neck deformity. Does that really matter? Does that really an indication for different treatment? I don't know. We worry about it, but it's not really in the main a long-term problem in the non-rheumatoids. 
very, very helpful, great, thanks. Mireya, any thoughts? Yes, I think that um, patient reported outcomes are uh, poorly sensitive to um, a functional uh, impairment of a DIP of a finger. And perhaps we could uh, see if those subluxated or those arthropathic post-traumatic fingers have a functional um, consequences to um, patients, but with uh, with something we, which could measure their impairment of their DIP mobility. Mm -hmm. an idea. Uh, Ryan, any other papers in the pipeline about this topic? Yeah, I mean, I, I think building on Gray's work, looking at pivot and glide, and and actually looking at a more dynamic assessment of the stability of the DIP joint in these injuries rather than the static Weber Schneider fairly you know simplified assumptions of what is unstable and even the Kim and Kim paper you know what's unstable and what's not so I, th I think building on Gray's work is, is the next step here. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, I, 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 I sit in the rehearsal, uh, we have been taught, many of us have been taught from a, from a young stage that you have to treat a bony mallet finger to prevent subluxation. I, I think, uh, as Grace said, maybe this is a, a myth that is slowly being debunked. But for a lot of people, uh, like the first paper, uh, they, they still need time, they still need some uh, convincing. And maybe more of this biomechanical studies, long-term uh, follow-up studies about degeneration, about, about, about uh, 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 the absence of dislocation, preservation of function uh, would help. There's, a, there's other questions uh, here, which um, I think uh, we have answered most of them. There's a question about Ishiguro technique. Again, uh, you know, it's very common, common uh, sort of myth almost. If you have a bony mallet finger injury, you should treat this with an issue guru technique with two K wires. It's very common. Do any of you use the issue guru technique? Do you use the issue guru technique spray or you just put a single K wire? Well, I mean, and it's interesting as a comment as well in the comment section. I mean, yeah. I think you worry, you want to use the issue guru technique if you think it matters that the two fracture fragments need to be close together. The Ishiguro technique rarely puts them close together anyway, but there doesn't need to be. So I think it's unnecessary. And therefore, if it's unnecessary, let's not do another piece of unnecessary surgery. If you can just do it, one K wire is enough to treat subluxation. You're not worried about the fracture fragment, which will heal back almost always. Another, another similar question is after you apply the stack splint, uh, do you ensure bony contact? And I think you've kind of answered that, right? And I, 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 I don't think you really, really... No, we don't, we, don't, we don't chase bony contact at all. We yeah. try and improve subluxation with a bit of flexion. That was one of the yeah. questions I saw come up. Um, yeah. But we, no, we don't chase the bony contact. So I think there's lots of uh, very interesting uh, things for food for thought tonight. Lots of uh, maybe myths that are being debunked. Now let's see whether that has resulted in people changing their practice. So we're going to have our last poll and, and see what happens. So, right. I hope this question is uh, framed correctly, but uh, let's see. So when managing a bony mallet finger injury with a bone fragment that's between one to two thirds, of the articular surface, I would. Well, more and more people are treating this conservative. No subluxation. Oh, Ryan, I did. I prepared this question last minute. It doesn't matter, does it? According to your paper, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Not to me. I, I think I framed this question just to highlight the point that when people see a bony mallet finger injury, sometimes they will treat it prophylactically to prevent subluxation. That's still a very common myth. So, so yes, you know, I, I, you know, in a sense, that it doesn't matter that for that in this question because that's still what a lot of people think in my experience. Uh, right, we have... Uh, so some people are treating this with K wires coming up. So, you know, again, this is, this is very interesting. Are you guys able to see the results of the poll? You, you can't, okay. Yeah, it came through on the first poll. Oh, yes. 
No, but now you can't see it moving. You can't see the re results. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing this in real time. I'm seeing initially all conservative, and then now conservative is flowing, uh, becoming less and operative more. Uh, okay. Uh, right, I will end the poll here because of time, and I will share my results. So this is the results of everyone. So it's interesting. I think more people tonight probably would treat their bony mallet finger injuries uh, conservatively. Uh, uh, this, is, this is the general impression I get. Uh, and there's still a certain percentage that will uh, treat this uh, with KYS and nobody will treat this with a hook plate, uh, Mireya. Uh, so, <laughs> right, I think we've come to the end of uh, this um, uh, journal club. I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight. I'd like to thank our uh, expert panel. You have been fantastic. I hope you enjoyed the process. I'd like to thank our uh, two presenters of the papers uh, and I'd like to thank uh, our authors so, for so bravely uh, attending this uh, journal club and uh, facing the questions. And I'd like to thank Jeff, uh, as always, uh, for sharing insights and the organizing committee who are behind the scenes and everybody that participated tonight and uh, asked questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.